could you describe uh, a typical day in Vietnam for you just from, you know, Reveille to retreat, or I suppose it'd probably be longer than that? Um, there were two sort of completely separate time periods. Uh, the first uh, year that I was there, and then the second year, year and a half that I was there. Uh, when I went overseas in July of 66, I was assigned to a, a fixed wing squadron, an A4 squadron, BMA 211, that was in uh, Iwakuni, Japan at the time. And so my first uh, three months overseas, uh, July, August, September, was in Iwakuni, which was just fabulous. I mean, it was the sure. Japanese were thrilled to death to have us there. Uh, we had pretty light schedules. I was the aviation electronics technician. So, um, you know, I just fixed radios, worked radios. And uh, the yen was 360 to the dollar, which meant we could go to the club and we could get a drink for a quarter. And we had a mama-san and a papa-san that cleaned the, cleaned the barracks so we didn't have China or shoes or our boots. I mean, it was a good life. And then in October, early October of 66, we got in a C-130 and we fl flew to Iwakuni. And the, the, the first part of the war started for me. We were flying uh, combat missions out of Iwakuni. I was fixing radios basically six days a week, um, 10 or 12 hour days while they were, uh, and I was purely a sport troop. Uh, now keep in mind that I had dropped out of high school to join the Marine Corps so I could shoot indigenous personnel. And the only way I was going to be able to cause harm to indigenous personnel is to screw up the radios. So the plane crashed. So uh, in the late fall or early January of 67, the 196 Light Infantry moved into uh, Chuai and they brought their aviation units with them. And so I immediately started going down with them and volunteering to fly with them. So I'd work six days a week, you know, sitting around most of the time bored and stiff. And then one day a week I'd go down and uh, we always flew on CH-47s. <clears throat> And so I do that. And that was my sort of experience uh, for the first year I was in Vietnam. Um, the, uh, the 47 was the sort of state of the art transport helicopter at the time. So okay. we got sniped in a lot, but never, you know, it wasn't like when I was in gunships later. So that continued until June of 67, and then in June of 67, I extended for a second tour of duty, second six-month tour of duty, came back to the United States for 30 days, traveled all over the United States and Canada, and then went back to Vietnam. When I went back, they had assigned me to VMO-2, the helicopter gunship squadron stationed at uh, Marble Mountain. And then I lived a completely different life. Now, keep in mind, I was still a, a electronics technician, but uh, VMO2 needed uh, door gunners. So I immediately volunteered to fly as a door gunner. Uh, they put me on flight pay in September of 67. I got trained to in aerial gunnery and how to lead and shoot the machine guns and clean them. And then in uh, October of 67, I started flying combat missions. And it was, um, it was a very interesting experience because by this point in time, I had already been in Vietnam for a year. I was salty and knew my way around and knew um, much of what I was doing. And so I picked out the meanest, toughest, most ferocious crew chief in the squadron and attached myself to him like a limpet mine, Charlie Maddox. 
And my rationale, my strategy was I want to fight with the um, gurus. I want to fight with the best. And that gives me my best likelihood of surviving and playing a meaningful part in the war. And, and it absolutely did. Uh, Maddox had already served a year in the squadron. He was on his second tour of duty. He had already been shot down a couple of times, including one time on SOG missions in Laos. He knew every pilot backwards and forwards. And, and Charlie, Charlie was a warrior. Uh, it's a, I think what a lot of people don't understand about people who serve in the military is um, there's a long tail of non-combatants that support the combatants. If you've got 100,000 uh, troops in Vietnam, probably 90,000 of that 100,000 are actually support for the 10,000 who actually fight. And of those 10,000, probably 8,000 of them are grunts and engage in frequent combat, daily combat. And maybe 2,000 of them do what we did, and that is they provide the aerial support for those troops. So I was still providing support, but it was aerial support. And it was, in my view, was the most aggressive um, combat sport. And uh, my days in that were a source of, uh, the word that comes to mind is delight, but that seems a little callous. Um, I've always been very aggressive in fighting for what I believe in. And if I couldn't be a pilot, I wouldn't be the next best thing. And the next best thing was a door gunner or a crew chief on a Huey gunship. And uh, we were in, uh, we would fly pretty much every day. Uh, some days we'd fly 10 or 12 hours. Other days we'd fly two. Um, uh, many of our missions were simply uh, gunship support. We'd go out with a UH-34 uh, medevac and we'd provide gun support for them if they needed it. Uh, some of our work was going out with uh, 46s, which were uh, 46s were used more for troop transport than the 34s were. The 34s in, in those conditions could only uh, carry perhaps four, um, you know, fully armed, loaded uh, grunts. But 46 could carry many more. And so if they wanted to do a transport in, they'd have half a dozen, seven, eight, 46s going in. And we'd be out with typically a flight of two or a flight of four uh, gunships. And that was... Um, Routine resupply, routine medevac, emergency medevac. Um, the Sparrowhawk missions, my favorite missions were the Sparrowhawk missions. Those were the missions where the ship would hit the fan and uh, they call for whoever was flying Sparrowhawk. And I tried to fly as many of those as I could because that was, that was where the combatants were. Mm -hmm. um, my strategy, which I, to this day, believe is that uh, if you're shooting at them, they're not shooting back at you accurately. And if you're shooting at them accurately, they're not shooting back at you at all. And my theory was I want to be shooting at those some bitches accurately. And we won't worry about them shooting at us because those some bitches won't have the balls to do that. And that's, that's uh, uh, actually been a, you know, I've been a trial lawyer for 45 years. And uh, it is a, I can tell you, it is an absolutely true maxim. <clears throat> so the majors and lieutenant colonels that were just trying to earn their four hours a month flight pay, they were going to fly the safest missions. And the young first lieutenants and captains, they were going to fly the toughest missions. And that's, that's where I was. 
That's a really interesting perspective there. Did you, so with Charlie, did you, did you stay in the same quarters as him? Did, were you like roommates or anything? We were, uh, we were roommates for a while. Uh, uh, it was not all the time I was there. We had 12 men hooches, plywood hooches. <clears throat> we were literally living on the beach at Marble Mountain. Uh, and um, so we were literally in the sand and we used um, uh, bunker crates to walk in the sand during the monsoon season. We had to have uh, uh, sandbag bunkers right outside the hooches and we'd have 12 guys in the hooch. And so part of the time I was there, Charlie and I were roommates, part of the time we were not. Okay. The, well, you were talking about the bunker crates. That's just to walk on the sand. I know at uh, FOB1 or what was also FOB4 at a certain time, uh, they said that they had problems with VC sappers, like putting toe poppers in the sand. Or was it that, was that infiltrators, Rob? You might remember yeah. something about yeah, that. Yeah, I think it was. And, um, yeah, and that was at, that was at Denang. Um, I don't know I if think, you had any. Yeah, I think I had somebody in the camp that was planting mines around the camp. Yeah, I was just wondering about walking on the platform. We, we didn't have an issue with that. Keep in okay. mind, we had a fence around the, the base. We had a, a marine guard around the base. We had Bob wire at the top. And the, the um, I don't remember which uh, special forces camp it was. I think it was CCN. Mm -hmm. There was an Arvin uh, prisoner of war camp that was immediately south of the Marble Mountain Air Facility. And then immediately south of that was, I think they call it CCN, which was literally adjacent to the base of Marble Mountain. When they wanted to attack us, it was uh, typically mortars or more often rockets because they weren't trying to kill us or wound us. They were trying to destroy the aircraft. And they had actually had a uh, famous uh, sapper attack on Marble Mountain, mm -hmm. I think in maybe February, March, April of 67, mm -hmm. the one where Tab Hunter's uh, brother was killed. He was out in a, out in a, a gunship uh, sleeping in case they had to launch. And the VC sappers got on the base and they, they had satchel charges, they threw in the aircraft, and they destroyed a number of the aircraft. But what we saw more routinely on Marble Mountain Air Facility, MMAF, was uh, uh, 122 or 140 millimeter rockets. And they were really shooting for the, for the aircraft. Now, the first rocket attack they had when I was there, which happened in August, they overshot the uh, the area where the aircraft were parked and all the rockets landed in the enlisted living area. And I had one rocket land maybe 15 yards, 20 yards from me, which ordinarily would have killed me. But uh, it l landed in a ditch. And so the back blast went up in the air and went through the roof of the hooches next to me where had it landed on a flat surface, it would have been broader out and it probably would have killed me. Cause I was, wow. <laughs> I was hauling ass for the bunker when that, when that fucker hit. Okay. Wow. Did you, did you have any type of, my uncle described, he was a fire direction controller uh, at Chulai um, with the Americal uh, division. And he said uh, that they had built little sandbag enclosures that they could roll off their their um bunk essentially into if they got under mortar fire i mean they were or rocket fire or artillery fire they were taking a lot over there i don't know if you had anything like that well keep in mind the americal division is 196 light infantry mm -hmm. so it's 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 uh, a, again it's a matter of different targeting when you've got uh, when you've got ground guys, they want to kill the guys. When you've got aircraft, they want to destroy the aircraft. So, sure. so he was. That would suggest to me he was in proximity of of uh, 
uh, grunt guys. Mm-hmm. But no, we didn't have anything like that. We had, and I, I can tell you to this day, you couldn't make me fill a sandbag. <laughs> sandbags. But, and we, 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 oh my God, we had an endless supply of sand. But we, we would build these bunkers where we dig down, uh, you know, three or four feet and then build up the sandbag on the side and then put mm-hmm. Marsden matting on the top and then put two layers or three layers of, of sandbags on top of that. And we, you know, we dash for the, uh, the uh, bunker when the rockets came in. Yeah. That does bring to mind a sort of a fun story. When I finished my second tour of duty, I extended for a third tour of duty. Now, these keep in mind the second and third tour of duty is only six months, but you got 30 days free leave in the States with that. And so probably late May or June of 68, I extend for another six months. I get the chance to get 30 days free leave in the States and uh, maybe three or four days before I was supposed to leave for the States, a pair of phantoms that were landing at Da Nang swung way way out. Keep in mind, Da Nang was probably five or six miles, maybe at the most seven miles from from, uh, Marble Mountain. And so these, these, these pair of phantoms were coming in at night, three or four o'clock in the morning, and they swung wide and they flew right over uh, Marble Mountain Air Facility at maybe a thousand feet. And a phantom makes a lot of noise. So I'm thinking incoming. So I go dashing for the bunker and I've got these bomb crates that I'm trying to hop over to get in the bunker and I make it the bunker and, I figure out I'm the only one in the bunker because it's just a couple of phantoms. So I go back and I get back in bed and my foot hurts. And I'm thinking, I don't know why my foot hurts. And so I get my flashlight out and the whole bottom of my foot was bloody because what had happened was I'd scraped the bottom of my foot. I'd scraped the skin off the bottom of my foot on this bomb crater as I'm hauling ass for the bunker. Well, I wasn't, the, the, the medical facility was literally across the street from where I was. So I go to the medical facility um, across the street the next morning. And he says, well, we're going to have to scrub all that sand out of there. You know, I embedded it with sand. And I said, well, what are you going to do for for Novocaine or for the pain. He says, nothing. And I said, well, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's just let that sand come out on its own. You know, it will come out in due time. So I go back and I've, I've, they wrap it up for me and I managed to get my foot in the boot and I can hobble around and I'm on crutches. Yeah, you know, I go to work. It wasn't a big deal because it wasn't like I'm flying. And so that afternoon or the next afternoon, the gunny comes and tells me they got your orders to go back to the States. I go, well, fuck. And so I go back over, because I would have to check out of Charlie Mead or whatever the name of the, the you know, the corpsman. I'm going to have to go get them to sign off for me to fly back to the States. So I go back and he says, well, I'm going to have to scrub all that out of there. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, do I let him scrub this shit out of there or do I cancel going back to the States. Mm. So I, I man up and cry like a baby. And he gets one of these scrub brushes like you scrub a floor with. <laughs> he's, he's scrubbing the bottom of my foot. And I'm telling you, it hurt like shit. Oh, it was man. not pleasant. I mean, I don't know why they were saving their Novocaine, but, but it hurt like shit. So he gets done with all of that. And he bandages it up. And of course, keep in mind the bottle of it's bleeding and seeping, you know, whatever it seeps. He wraps it up, but I get signed off to go back to the United States. So by this time, I'm a sergeant. I very proudly wear my combat air crew wings, which means I've been in combat and I'm senior. And so I go over to, to 
Denang to get on the Freedom Bird, and we fly to to um, Okinawa, and um, all these guys are volunteering to carry my bags. Something you don't need to carry my fucking bags. I carry my own bags now. I'm on crutches, but I got my suitcase with me, and they're volunteering to carry it out for me, and they carry it for me when I land in Okinawa. And I'm thinking, these dumb son bitches think I'm a wounded, saving their life, and I'm never going to tell them what happened. I, but they, 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 I will go to my grave not telling these guys I'm a dumbass that tripped over a bomb, bomb crate. So I, I'm on Okinawa for three or four days, go to the go to foreman, get signed off again, and fly the United States. And by this time, I have had it with, with um, guys volunteering to carry my bags for me because they think I'm a hero that I got wounded saving their ass. And so when I get to San Francisco, I manage to stuff my, my foot into a shoe. And by now it's healed up a little bit so I can actually walk. So I throw away the, the, um, crutches and of course in those days you flew in uniform you had to fly and of course marines always were very handsome and looked great in their in their their uh, their uh, uniform so i'm i'm going through the airport in san francisco about to fly back to houston and i run into one of these guys who's been carrying my bag and now oh, no. he crutches and I'm thinking, well, fuck, I can't tell this guy what happened. And the guy's, the guy, the guy's going to think I wore these crushes just to get, feel sorry for me. And so I was, I never, I never did. I wasn't about to tell anybody that story. I was, I was embarrassed. <laughs> so you better just slip by him? <laughs> no, I didn't slip by him. It was like mom walking in after you've been masturbating. You know, they don't get you in the act, but they know you've been doing something. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh man. Okay, I want to I want to backtrack just a little bit to uh back at Marble Mountain. You mentioned CH46s. I'm guessing that you had those H34s and your gunships at the compound with you, right? We had we were in the the, the squadron area that was farthest from the living area, the MO2. There was a 46 squadron that was north of us. There was a, a 53 squadron that was immediately next to them. Um, and then I think there was a 34 squadron next to them. Keep in mind, this was during the time period that the uh, 46s were breaking apart. And uh, I actually saw two of them do that, and it was pretty interesting. There was a um, – everybody needs to see a helicopter crash at least one time in their lifetime. It just absolutely beats the shit out of a fixed-wing crash because a fixed-wing crash is just – you know, not a lot to it. When a helicopter crashes, shit goes everywhere, and so the they uh, there was uh, I don't know exactly what the problem was with forty sixes, but they had a tendency to break apart in the middle as a vibration issue, mm. a lack of adequate reinforcement of the main fuselage, and you know it was harsh conditions in Vietnam. And so the, there was a 46 squadron literally right next door to us. And uh, I watched the 47, 46 that was running up, breaking apart. And I'm oh telling you, shit was going cool everywhere. <laughs> and it was, you know, the first thing that goes through your mind is, is I hope those guys are okay. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, we have probably just lost four, four of those guys. Because I mean, it was a pile of pile of parts about about that deep, you know. It wasn't wasn't a helicopter anymore. We call that process making two UH twenty threes. So 
you know, parts, most of the parts have fallen out of the air and everybody's coming out to watch this shit and everybody's thinking the same thing I am. I sure hope those guys are okay. And then you see these guys getting out of the airplane and they're all puckered up. And, and if they didn't have helmets on, they'd be twice as tall because they are, <laughs> they're, they're, their ass had sucked down their helmet and, uh, but they were they were all okay. But it was wow. it was pretty pretty interesting. Yeah. Oh my I god. I saw them do the same thing in the air when it was coming in to land, and that was the one that a, a marine general was flying. I forget what the guy's name was. He wasn't a general then. He was like a lieutenant or a captain then. But he went on and did a career in the Marine Corps, and he basically crashed landing of forty six at Marble Mountain. So it was, it was wow. It's worth worth seeing. Now, I, I say that with a sense of humor. Keep in mind that I I crashed my UH-34, and the thing that I remember, and I've still got pictures of it that that I remember with great interest, was there was a trail of parts about 500 yards behind where that airplane was, where I where I was slinging shit. You know, when a helicopter is in a hover. It's drawn almost full power. It's actually using less power when it's uh, in transitional lift and flying. So when it's in a hover and you think, well, it's, there's not that much energy, that's when all of the energy is, is being used or 95% of it. And so when they have vibration problems or breaking apart problems or parts fall off problems. It's pretty dramatic. I mean, you, you shit just goes everywhere. My God. Yeah. I, I can imagine. I, we got to hear the story of that you, so you crash your UH 34. How did that happen? I was going to an air show. I was flying to an air show, uh, uh, at new river, uh, in North Carolina. And I was going to stop and visit Nancy Pless. I'd become friends with Nancy Pless uh, when I did an air show out in California in uh, the year 2000. So I met her and, you know, I looked like her son and I was, you know, same age and she missed her son. So I was going to fly to Noonan, New Georgia and stop by and see her. And then I was going to go from there to New River. I had a, a, uh, cop uh, crew chief that was in the left seat and there was a heavy, fairly heavy, you know, 15 or 20 mile an hour crosswind coming in from my side. And I had to get to a fuel tank that was just the other side of the hangar. Uh, and, and then I had to get the fuel line out to the right hand side of the aircraft so I could could fill it up with hundred low lead, and so I landed the aircraft, and I'm ground taxiing the aircraft by the hangar to the fuel tank, and the the guy who was in the left seat didn't have his glasses on, so he couldn't see that clearly, and so he got me about six inches too close to the telephone pole in the hangar, and that, that blade hits that hanger at the very end of the blade where it's going the fastest and shit went everywhere. And all of a sudden the aircraft, I thought we had been hit by a truck or something because the aircraft's bucking and kicking and stuff and shrapnel's going through the windshield and shrapnel's going through the back and being slung out the back. And um, it was scary. And it, it was fortunately, thank God, there had been a bunch of kids that had been at the been at this this FBO just before then, and they had literally just left. And if they had been there and they'd been out on the on the on the on the ramp watching, there would have been a bunch of those kids hurt. So I was I was uh, grateful that no one was hurt. Now destroyed the aircraft, and that was you know sucked, but nobody was hurt, and I was grateful for that. It was kind of funny. I had had, uh, had a Marine crew chief who was down in the cabin. 
I had a civilian uh, guy who uh, was a helicopter wannabe who was in the left co-pilot seat and then me. And so we, we call the FAA and we, you know, tell them where to ship the parts. And, and uh, so we found a car that we could rent or a cab that we could rent to take us to another airfield. This was a, a, an airfield in rural Mississippi. And we figured out we were going to have to pay somebody to haul us to Jackson. And then we'd fly home from Jackson. And so we get in this car and it's this old black guy and there's um, him and then three of us. And so two of us sat in the front. I'm not exactly sure why and one in the back and he's got a joint <laughs> right in the, right in the, the front of the seat, you know, in the ashtray. And of course this, this, my co-pilot, not a civilian, is a cop. And so oh. his, his eyes are about this big. And so we, we, we talked this guy into taking us to a greasy spoon where we can get something to eat. And so we're at this greasy spoon and we all order hamburgers and I'm chowing mine down cause I'm starving and my Marine Corps buddy's chowing his down cause he's hungry. And Steve, my civilian, who was the guy who didn't bother to, tell me where the hangar was he can't eat and he said you know i couldn't i couldn't get water down if you shoved it down with a fork uh, down my throat because my throat was so constricted and you know my attitude was well you know nobody got hurt you know shit happened so we'll just yeah. live with it but that's that was my that was my crash story it was uh, the all of the radios from that aircraft ended up in the UH-34 that sits proudly on the main deck at the National Museum of the Marine Corps, and I helped fund the restoration of that aircraft. Oh, uh, that's great! And helped fly that aircraft there when when uh, when they when we gave that aircraft back to the Marine Corps. The only time, you know, I felt like I owed the Marine Corps an aircraft since I shot one down. I felt like I needed to help give one back. And so we did. That's wonderful. Yeah. No, I suppose sometimes you just, the universe decided it was time for that one to retire. Yeah, well, that, well, that would be, the, uh, uh, that would be a lawyerly way to describe it. <laughs> okay. A uh, couple more questions about uh, missions. What was, what, what was the process that you're, unit would go through to prepare for a mission or was it kind of just reactionary and just readiness? No, it was, they, they had a distinct process. I was initially flew as door gunner. And so what I would do is I would volunteer to go fly. We had more people in the radio shop in the avionic shop than we needed to have work on radios because basically what we were doing at squadron level is sticking radios in the aircraft and taking radios out of the aircraft. We weren't doing the electronics. We weren't doing the, the fixing the tubes or the transistors. We weren't doing depot level maintenance. We were just fixing, you know, my microphone didn't work or, Mm. My head that didn't work or my earphones that were uh, essentially relatively minor problems. So there's always somebody free and I would volunteer to fly as many missions as I could. The crew chief was, uh, crew chiefs initially were all mechanics trained as mechanics or hydraulics people. And they would service the aircraft overnight, check all the fluid levels, uh, see to it that the aircraft was, properly fueled, properly armed. Um, uh, we had two types of aircraft. We had slicks, which were UH, or, uh, uh, UH-1Es that didn't have the gun mount kit or the rocket kit. And then we had gunships that had uh, uh, external rocket pod and uh, machine gun mounts. The slicks would fly what we call green taxi service. They'd fly senior Marines officers around to visit areas of the battlefield. 
gunships, of course, provided gunship support. So the ops officer would assign the um, frag order for the next day's anticipated missions the night before crew chiefs would go over uh, that mission. They'd see what pilots were assigned, uh, what crew were assigned, and then make the aircraft ready for the mission. Because we were typically flying missions from bright and early in the morning. We might, now we'd, we'd have aircraft that would be on standby for night uh, uh, gunship support missions, but we didn't fly a lot of night missions primarily because they were all VFR missions. There weren't a lot of lights out in the, in the uh, countryside and there were mountains to fly around. So you didn't want to be flying a whole lot of missions at night, but we did have night missions that I volunteered to fly from time to time where we were uh, emergency of go out and attack the, where the rockets were launched from kind of missions. Oh, wow. We, we, did, we would not typically fly. Um, we weren't doing rockets or machine guns at night because of the difficulty of spotting the uh, where the friendlies were. Uh, we did go out when uh, uh, we'd fly aerial control missions where the pilot would be the aerial controller for like a, a this, uh, I think it was really a DC-3 where they would put uh, uh, like a 105 uh, recoilless rifle in it or they put the mini guns in it. And so we would go out on those missions and they, they, they had better ability to determine where their fire was gonna go than we did. So when we were doing emergency night missions for grunt units that were under attack, we typically control um, the spooky, the the uh, DC threes with the mini guns, which is really pretty cool. Because wow. it's you listen to that, you listen to that, and the and the and see the tracers. It's pretty cool. Uh, so that was sort of how we set up the missions. That's amazing. I yeah, I'd never heard of uh, a gun, and that was in a gunship. You'd be flying around in a gunship directing the spooky right. gunship. And you said they had a hundred hundred five millimeter recoilless rifle up in that thing. Right. Wow. Now, I wow. Think Have you heard got, that? Right. I, I I forget what they've got now. Maybe a howitzer. Yeah, they yeah. do. You know the gunships they've got now make the gunships we had look like pansies. But but the the uh, the DC three I think it was one of one of five recoilless rifle, but they have both a a, uh, a HE capacity and then they had the the mini guns. Wow, they were they were pretty cool. That's very cool. Wow, that's that's awesome. And uh, one more question. So covered almost everything on our missions. I'm just wondering, what did the briefing look like for those missions? Are you going in and talking to S3 and S2, looking at a map, or are you just going through with your crew? We were, we were well, first off, uh, I flew only with the experienced crew chiefs. So, and I was, you know, by this time I was north of a year, year and a half in Vietnam. So I was very familiar with what was going on. But no, they didn't bother to brief the the, the, the officers would typically uh, get their briefing uh, at Marble Mountain when we were flying uh, whatever grunt unit we were flying in support of. We'd fly out to that unit, uh, unit oh. um, and we'd land there. The pilots would go get briefed. We did a lot of. I think it was first recon that was based out of Da Nang and the first Marine division was based out of Da Nang. And essentially we were flying. I don't remember doing any aerial support for army units. Not, and I don't think there were any army units, any army ground units uh, in the Da Nang area when I was there. Now they had a Mohawk squadron and it was across the field from us on Marble Mountain. And I think they had some O-1 Charlies that were 
across the field from us, but we didn't do any Army sports, all, all Marine. So if we fly to first recon and land there and the officers would be brief, or we, and, and that was, those were recon inserts where, and those were pretty cool because the, uh, we'd go out and we'd prep the zone for the 34s. And that was, that was, that was cool stuff. And we'll talk about that. I think we got some questions specifically about how that worked uh, after the next section here, but I'll uh, transfer it over to you, Rob. Right. So I think um, I've been jumping around on the questions because Jim's answered a lot of them as we've gone along. Um, yeah. So I think I've just got a couple of questions about weapons, Jim. So um did you ever use the 17 pound um, HE rockets, you know, that stick out of the tubes? No. You don't remember if you did or you didn't? Yeah, you gotta remember, you, you're talking the army. The fucking army's got weapons that we never even dreamed of. They had many right. guns. I mean, you, if, if you, <clears throat> there was a, uh, one of the reasons I shot my own airplane down is, is the internal gun mount for the Marine Corps was an iron, a one inch iron pipe with a, a deal on the top with a little steel tip welded in it that was supposed to stop the gun from rotating. You look at the Army. fucking Army had all sorts of cool shit. <clears throat> right. So pretty much, I mean, you had, you had quad 60s on the, um, on the gunships, right? So, so four M60s lying on their side sort of thing, mounted on the side, on the left we, side. We had, we had that. And then we had the two internal M60s, and some of our aircraft had the TAT-101. In fact, the, the gunship that belongs to the Collins Foundation that I also helped pay to restore, um, the TAT-101 was put on that aircraft, and a friend of mine was the pilot who signed off on the installation. So you go look at the... the uh, the naval records for that aircraft and it's you see the tat 101 signed off by my buddy al barber hmm. that's I've that chin from, gun right say again is that that chin gun that goes underneath the two it was a twin m60 that in theory rotated and could be put up and down it was the really the first of the uh controllable uh, machine guns, but it tended to be very unreliable. If the the external M60s had a malfunction, we were there to clear the malfunction. But if you know, the TAP 101 had a malfunction, and they malfunctioned all the time, um, hmm. you know, they uh, frankly, all it was was dead weight. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was going to ask about that because I've spoken to other um, former Marine aviators on Facebook and they were saying that that thing wasn't worth shit. You know, it was, yeah. it used to jam a lot and, and you know, a misfeed and that'd be it. Um, yeah. And I think, I think even in Gulf War One, there were, there's, I read a memoir of a Cobra, a Marine Cobra pilot and, and, and he, he, he fought the entire war with his, nose gun not working just using rockets because again it was just you know it got a load of sand in it or something and then it wouldn't work and and, it, and they didn't have any downtime to do any refit or repair they would literally just constantly 24 7 going for it yeah and so he spent the whole time with his primary gun not working you know right and it sounds like it hasn't changed since vietnam <laughs> Well, I think the, the, the gunships today, uh, particularly the 20 bike mic and the, the, the helmet control, I think that there's, if, if you go back, yeah, well, I mean, you guys have that, that, uh, uh, you've got that Huey in England. You go back and look at the, those aircraft and you look at their electronics and their, power systems and you look at the modern aircraft and it's different during day day and night. I mean those were literally the the 34 was a second generation helicopter. The the Huey and the 53 were third generation. And you look at these 
fifth generation aircraft today, particularly, well, even the Marine Corps. The CH-53 that the Marine Corps uh, just put in, CH-53K is a monster. And uh, the, the uh, I was at Fort Bragg maybe a month ago for an award ceremony. Uh, and before that was there for another ceremony. And I go over and I was flying the simulator for the, uh, the uh, CH-47 and the Black Hawk and the, the gunship. And um, the 47 is like, uh, you're just operating a computer. The aircraft's flying itself, you're flying a computer. I could go get in a 34 or a Huey today not having been in one in 15 years, I can fly the airplane 10 minutes. But I, I got in a simulator for the 47. It was, it was, it was scary. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> sounds like great fun, but a lot of a lot of dials you've probably never seen before. And it was well, they didn't have any computers in those days. They didn't have GPS. I mean, we were flying off a TACAN and a ADF and an ADF. Technology goes back to before World War Two, and and what what um think about what you took with you on your mission. So I guess you would have worn a chicken plate and and uh, and then what an M sixteen and a and a pistol or something. You'd you'd wear the front part of a chicken plate again. Keep in mind we were weight limited, so you never carried front and back, and you figured you know you were going to be shot from the front, not from the back. Um, some people would would just sit on their chicken plate because there's, I think, I forget whether the, the chicken plate, I think it weighed like 22 or 24 pounds front and back. And so it was a lot of weight to carry and it was, it was hard maneuvering in the aircraft, but I typically wore the front plate. Uh, we did not have M16s when I got there. We still had M14s. So we'd carry the, uh, we'd each carry an M14 or Charlie would, I'd carry an M14 and Charlie carry an M79 and then a canister of, of HE rounds for the M79. And then we had, had uh, linked 762 under, under the, the whole width of the, uh, the crew seating area. And did you ever have to use those in anger? We never used the M. <laughs> uh, I remember a trick that Charlie taught me about um, um, using the M79 or using grenades from the air. Now, keep in mind, Charlie had flown SOG missions where they were going in Laos where everything was a free fire zone. So Charlie would talk about how they take uh, mason jars and they'd, they'd stick a, a stick a grenade in the mason jar and then they'd pull the pin on the mason jar, but because the jar would hold the, the pin in or would hold the, the um, spoon. Whatever, you know, spoon in, launch that out of the aircraft, and then when it hit the ground, it'd break and you'd get a ground explosion. If the time to throw the grenade out of the aircraft. If you pull the pin in the aircraft, you threw it out, it would explode in the air and the air burst didn't do a whole lot of good. Uh, and I think, as I vaguely recall, we, we never used the M79 uh, for anything except backup for ground emergencies because, <clears throat> again, because you're so high and it's got a relatively limited range, it would start tumbling, and when it would tumble, it wouldn't go off when it hit. So, um, what what kind of things were you getting uh, coming back the other way in terms of uh, VC firing at your ship? Well, my uh, memory was we got shot at every time we flew. You know, there was a distinction between a strike flight uh, mission and a non-strike flight mission. If you flew a mission where you never got shot at, you got credit for one mission. If you uh, got shot at at any time during the mission, I think maybe you got credit for three missions. 
And then you had to have like 20 missions or 25 missions qualify for what was called the strike flight air medal. So uh, routinely, um, first off, because we were flying relatively low, we liked it when people shot at us. When people shot at us, we got to shoot back. And so, you know, it wasn't like we were in a 34 and we were essentially defenseless. We were an aerial weapons platform during some summit shoot at us. But my, uh, I can remember the missions that I flew when we didn't get shot at a whole lot more vividly than I can the missions we got shot at because we got shot at almost every day, almost every mission. And, and how, did you ever see RPGs coming up at the aircraft or, or 51 cals? No, we got shot at by 51 cal, yeah. Uh, we, didn't get, we didn't get shot at by RPGs. And again, we were, uh, when the lowest we got was when we were pulling out of gun runs. Now, it was not unknown <clears throat> for a gunship to come back with, with tree shit stuck in the skids, we, we could get down pretty low, and especially the aggressive pilots. But when they're, they're, they're doing 120, 130 miles an hour in that gun run, and then they're peeling off. And so um, I had no recollection of ever being shot at with an RPG, but we were, we were shot at with a, a 50 caliber. And we had had aircraft take fifty caliber hits. I've heard people describe it as seeing, you know, huge basketballs coming up towards you when you when you have tracer off of those things. Does that ring any bells with you? No, it was uh, you know the usual story was if you could see the tracer it wasn't going to hit you. It was the one you couldn't see that was going to hit you. So we, you know, we see green shit flying by. So, so what can you tell us about the sniffer missions, Jim? The Army had a device, an optical device, that was like twice the size of a footlocker that could be carried in an aircraft. And then it would have a hose that would go out into the airstream, and the airstream would direct uh, air through this device and the device uh, was capable of picking up and identifying two things, campfires and uh, the ammonia that's common in urine uh, and only for a single, for human beings, and like only a single kind of monkey that doesn't live in Southeast Asia. So the Army, or you know, DARPA or whoever it was, developed this weapon. And so in the uh, fall and winter of 1967, we had one of these sniffer devices assigned to us. And we put it in the aircraft or the, you know, the technician put it in the aircraft. And what they do, do is they take the, the uh, external gun kit off the aircraft, or they put it in a slick. So we had uh, the device inside the aircraft and the only armament we had was the two internal M60s. And the way the mission profile, we would fly all of these missions in Northern i typically around Quezon. And so in uh, November and December of 67, we were, we'd launch for Quezon. Now keep in mind, this is before the ship really hit the fan. So we could actually land on Quezon and we spend the night on Quezon. And um, so we'd launch with a, a slick with this, the, the sniffer in it and then with one high cover gunship. And so when, when we were flying the sniffer aircraft, we'd fly map of the earth over the mountains over a grid course and we do back and forth on a grid course looking for the scent of ammonia or 
campfires where we were attempting to locate the NVA that were approaching the Quezon uh, Marine Base and the, the uh, uh, Special Forces camp that was, I think it was Lang Bay, that was right outside of Quezon. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Charlie and I would fly the sniffer and it was, you know, you're basically doing 70 to 120 knots over the over the mountains flying down to the earth and and even at 70 or 80 knots when you're going up the mountainside you're flying over it fast enough where nobody's really able to effectively fire on you and um i don't recall us ever having any issues with that except the one thing that was pretty funny is that we had pink elephants um it was a you know, they had some unusual uh, un- unusual animals in Southeast Asia at that time. They had tigers, and they were actually, they actually uh, had tigers who would kill American soldiers, Marines, and times when the American soldiers, Marines, would kill a tiger, and they'd bring the tiger skin back. But when we were flying these sniffer missions, we actually saw some pink elephants that we hypothesized came in from Laos and they were hauling equipment for the VC or the NVA and we call them VC elephants. Wow. So what pink elephants we- are real then? Oh yeah. Well the, yeah. the the soil the soil in Laos in some areas had a high iron content. And so it, it's the you go through it and and you'd you'd see you'd absolutely see pink elephants. It looked look pink to us. We thought just seeing an elephant was cool. So, did did you often with a gunship? Would you would you often work in a duo? Uh, you know, like like on a racetrack covering each other. So when always, one, one doesn't run. Almost uh, when we would fly, when we would fly uh, medevac escort, that was typically a. A uh, single 34 or a single 46 and a single gunship. And the idea was we were partners. If we got shot down, they'd pick us up. If they got shot down, we'd pick them up or we'd provide gun support for them and radio support. When we would fly like the sniffer missions, we'd fly as part of the team. And when we would fly, uh, typically transport missions where they transport a number of Marines. We'd fly in a flight of two or sometimes a flight of four. And yeah, we were flying racetrack and it was, it was, uh, there were a couple of components of it. One component of it was, is we would typically roll out to the right or we'd roll out to the left as we complete a gun run, never straight ahead because we were, that was when we were most vulnerable. And that would give either the door gunner or the crew chief the opportunity to provide covering fire to the rear. And at the same time, the Dash 2 aircraft would be in a high position ready to come in, roll in, and they'd roll in behind us. So we had gun cover from our internal guns and we had gun cover from our Dash 2 aircraft. And we, were, I, I was almost always in the Dash 1 aircraft because that was typically the senior pilot, not senior by rank, but senior by combat experience. Can you, can you kind of put it in words what it, what it felt like to be hanging out the side of a helicopter firing a machine gun while it's doing a rocket run? <laughs> Exhilarating. It was a, uh, keep in mind that I was a volunteer in the Marine Corps. I was a volunteer in Vietnam. I was a volunteer to stay in Vietnam. And I was a volunteer to fly as a door gunner or crew chief. So I was doing what I wanted to do. And I was uh, young and stupid. You know, I was 20 or 21 or 22 years old. And, you know, as I look back, I think, you know, 22-year-olds don't have sense for piss out of a boot. And while we were, in theory, courageous and full of piss and vinegar, that was because we thought we were bulletproof, which, of course, wasn't true. 
So, um, and it was a, uh, I was, in my view, perfectly situated to be a door gunner or crew chief or a pilot because um, I'm biased towards action. I'm not excessively fearful. In fact, I'm probably excessively non-fearful. I'm uh, optimistic. And, uh, you know, this notion, there, there are a lot of principles of life that I've lived by that to me are just common sense. The very idea, you know, some people think when there's incoming fire, duck. But the principle is if you're shooting at them, they're not shooting at you accurately. So you can raise up, you can start putting rounds down range, and you should, because if you don't, they're going to start shooting accurately and then you die. And if you're shooting at them accurately, they are truly not shooting at you at all. And that's a, um, I've done plaintiff's work now for 40 years. And that's absolutely a principle that I apply every single day in what I do. Uh, if I'm sitting around being passive, looking around for all the things that can go wrong, I'm going to die. If I've got them sitting around looking around for everything that can go wrong, they will die. And that's a, a, what I do professionally is a absolutely a form of combat. Do, do you recall ever clipping trees with the aircraft? Oh, yeah. We came back with pieces. <laughs> we came back with green shit in the skids. You know, you did what you, you, did what you had to do. It was a, uh, um, I forget when they put it into effect, and why they put it into effect, but they put in a, a rule that they wanted us to fly at a thousand feet or higher. And that meant you had to go up 1500 feet, start a gun run, and you had to come out of it at a thousand feet. Well, at a thousand feet, you're not nearly as accurate as you are when you're much closer. And, um, it was a, there's a, there's a constant tension in combat between take more risk and win, take less risk and survive. There's, there's that constant tension. And unfortunately, if everybody puts survival at the very top of their wish list, you got to learn to speak Japanese or you got to learn to speak Russian or you got to learn to speak German because that's what's going to happen. Somebody has to be willing to get out there and stick their neck out and risk their life for their country to convince somebody else not to do what they're doing. Uh, well, I will say this. Um, what you guys are doing is extraordinarily important. When you guys do these interviews, when you post these podcasts, when you post the, when you do the stuff you've done in the games, the support you've given, speaking of which, I want to talk to you about Paris Davis. Um, you guys are telling the story of the bravest people I've ever met in my life. Um, I got there, I got overseas in July of 66. And when I got to Vietnam in October of 66, we knew we were going to lose the war. Uh, we knew it was all bullshit. Uh, we had some idea that the excuses they used for taking us to war were bullshit. And we knew the people we were supporting did not have the moral high ground. They were, I, I despised Vietnamese uh, when I came back from Vietnam because the people we were supporting were all a bunch of goddamn bloodsuckers. They wouldn't fight their own missions. They wouldn't die for their country. They were all milking us like the Afghanis milked us for two decades. And I despise the Vietnamese. Now, I've, I've, I've relaxed my attitude since then. And I certainly recognize 
how fundamentally flawed a communist dictatorship is. I certainly don't support that, but we didn't lose war. Those guys that I met that flew the SOG missions in 69 and 70 and 71, if they were still doing missions after 70, were literally the bravest people I've ever seen in my life. And they all knew who were to lose war. Now, some of them were what I call fascist, you know, right wing, sloop flag, our government's never wrong, you know, kind of people. They're a little bit part of the right of me, but you can't fault them for courage and bravery or integrity. I think I told you the story of, of uh, Mike Rose when Mike Rose was on a mission and they shot up the guys that three guys that were following them and one of them was wounded. Mike slapped an IV on the guy and wrote out the note so that the NVA medics could save this guy's life. Guy's been trying to kill him five minutes earlier. To me, that's integrity. And you guys are telling those people's story. My story is not important. My story is sort of fun, but it's not particularly important. I'm not anybody special or different. But those guys are extraordinary. What we would do when the 196 moved into July, the Marine grunt units moved north to the northern part of i -Corp. The Rock Marines moved into Chulai, and the Rock Marines were providing security around Chulai. And so they had no uh, embedded aircraft support. So we would launch a flight of two or a flight of four uh, aircraft to support them. And we typically stay down there sometimes two or three days. And there were a couple of couple of instances that happened down there that were pretty good. The uh, uh, any time we got away from the base, things got loosey goosey. And uh, one time I was down there with this this pilot who I just had huge respect for, and Charlie loved Captain Richardson. And uh, Richardson was an interesting guy. He was a drunk, and when he was on the ground, he was pure trouble, and he was in hack all the time for various and sundry misconduct he'd do. But when that asshole would strap on a Huey, he was the most dangerous human being you've ever seen in your life. He became a warrior. He was unbelievable. So we're, we're down with the Rock Marines one time, and we land a flight or two, and we're sitting around the aircraft and he's getting briefed by this, uh, these rock officers. And what had happened was the sniper had taken a shot at them and it really pissed off the rocks because they thought, you know, we're embarrassed that, you know, these Marines have flown down here to provide cover for us. And we've taken a sniper out because it suggests that we're not controlling our security. So they decided that they wanted to have us take out this tree line that this, this uh, sniper fired from. The sniper was probably long gone, but they still wanted us to take out this tree line. So Charlie and I start to mount up in the aircraft, and Captain Richardson says, no, don't bother. We're over the fuck. And so he cranks up the airplane. Now he's in the airplane by himself and we're sitting on the ground and, you know, we got rock Marines all around us. So he cranks up the aircraft. He points it at the tree line and he salvos these 2.75 inch rockets at the tree lines. It just blows the shit out of this tree line. Well, these, these rock uh, Marines didn't realize you don't stand behind a 2.75 inch rocket because there's pieces of electronics, the pieces of wiring that are blown out of the back. So, so he's backblasted all of these, all of these, these rock uh, Marines 
as he's blowing this this tree line away, and these rock officers thought blowing that tree line away was the coolest thing they ever saw. They thought that was just fabulous. Well, that was one sort of fun thing. And there was another fun thing. You know, the Army had the pilot flying on the left. So these rocks had been flown around when they were doing green taxi service flown around the army guys. And so they would treat whoever was sitting in the left seat as the pilot in command. So we're, uh, one of our pilots, and by this time I had become a crew chief, one of our pilots, myself, have launched down to support the rocks. And I'm flying in the left seat, but I'm a crew chief. Pilots flying in the right seat. So... <laughs> These rock officers, including the rock general, get in the aircraft and they're ignoring the pilot and they're sitting there <laughs> chatting away with me and telling me, okay, this is going on and take me here and do this and do that. And they're not noticing that I'm not touching the stick that whoever's sitting in the right seat is doing all the flying. And I don't think they ever figured out that, that I was just a, just a, a crew chief on the aircraft and not the pilot. They probably should have been talking to the real pilot. Not me. 